I'm trying to be a bit of a disruptor, but not because I just want to disrupt, but because I think there's a, an opportunity to improve a blind spot that exists within the jujitsu culture. 12 hours of postural positioning that you're going to correct all this with 15 minutes of this, it's not going to fucking happen. It's, it's a fantasy in your head. If you do two less jujitsu classes a week because you traded them for yoga, it may take you a little longer to get to your black belt, but you'll get to your black belt in a fucking great healthy body. Or you want to get to your black belt wrecked. Why are men struggling? They're struggling because they're missing their tribe. They're missing rite of passage. They're missing community. They're missing all the, the, the qualities that are necessary to develop themselves you know, as a part of something more than themselves. Do some martial arts because you do 15 minutes of this. <laughs> so you, 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 you <laughs> pop around the room, punching in the air a little bit and doing some kicks and some knees. And for 15 minutes, you shadow box around the room and then you say you do martial arts. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is a black belt in Taekwondo, in Karate Do and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He is the founder and director of Budokan, the father of mixed movement arts, Cameron Shane. Cameron, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. How are you? Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me. No, it's a pleasure, mate, and uh, we're, we're really looking forward to this because uh, we, you know, do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and and I've done a number of martial arts over the years. And an area for me in particular is is always, or a limiting area, I feel, has always been my movement. So really interested to get your take on, uh, on maybe where I'm potentially going wrong and and where probably a lot of people are going wrong as well. Before we get into all that, and I mean, this may cover it, but obviously you're the founder of Budokan Mixed Movement Arts um, and the director of that. Can you just tell us, first of all, what, what that is? Well, the term Mixed Movement Arts is, you know, it's a reflection of the variety of movement languages within our system. So the, the same, uh, I mean, I just borrowed the, the phrase from mixed martial arts, which uh, obviously adequately, um, I think, uh, sort of describes what mixed martial arts is. It's obviously a, a, a number of different languages taught as, as, as a, you know, hopefully, as a singular, you know, approach to combat. So, you know, it doesn't, it's not very helpful if you know how to wrestle and you know how to strike and you know how to submit, you know, in submission grappling, but you don't know how to connect the three. And that's the whole point of, of mixed martial arts would be to not just <laughs> have them uh, as independent actors, but to have them uh, as, as, as a, you know, a, a unified body, like it, it'd be, um, it'd be important that each uh, is contributing to the other and that they, that they have these very important uh, places where they intersect and those intersection points uh, bring, you know, bring it together and make it uh, become, uh, you know, in and of itself, a new martial arts style, it makes martial arts. Uh, and so mixed movement arts for me, again, to just borrow that idea and modify it slightly, would to say that uh, for us, we have martial arts, combat arts, and we have uh, conditioning arts uh, within our system. And, and, and whether you call it, a, a, you know, a, a conditioning element and art is, is subjective. Um, some people would think of yoga as an art form. Uh, or, uh, you know, or, or even strength training as their art form. I mean, I think uh, uh, Schwarzenegger would think of strength training for him. That was his art. I don't think he would think of it as something he did, uh, you know, in the gym, uh, you know, as some like you know, calisthenic stay in shape exercise, but this was his craft. So I think of us, you know, we have sectors or languages. Mobility training is a language. Uh, yoga is is a language in and of itself. Um, personal development 
is a language for us. And, uh, you know, strength training, calisthenics is a language. Personal development is a good example. In, in mixed martial arts, there's no implication that the mixed martial artist is has any obligation to develop themselves, their character, their, you know, their, their general humanity in order to be, uh, uh, you know, a black belt or, uh, you know, a, a prize fighter. But in our system, the, you know, personal development is, is being measured. Well, I don't want to develop another, another guy who can fight, but who doesn't have excellent character. So for us in our system, that's, that's, you know, that's a crucial part of it. Yeah, that's interesting. And I guess when you're talking character, um, I guess that's relatively object, uh, subjective, isn't it? Um, you know, when we're talking about prize fighting in particular, you know, you can, you can kind of measure someone's ability and success based on performance. But with character, it seems to be a little bit more subjective. So how, how do you measure that? Well, my students or, or, or the black belts that I'm developing, they, they need to be philosophical people. My job is not to tell another human being whether they're living the right or the wrong life. My job is to, is to provoke them as a thinker and as a critical thinker, a problem solver. I, 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 it's, not, it's not up to me to tell them they're solving the problem the right way or the wrong way because objectively, uh, I don't believe that there is a right or wrong. And, and that's the, that the philosopher's path, which, you know, if, if we sort of connect this to say the samurai, if you want to connect it to a Japanese sort of the, the earliest model of this I, idea from the martial arts world that, that, that I think was codified very well was, you know, you're looking to create a Renaissance character, someone who's uh, a, an artist, uh, a scientist, uh, uh, you know, a warrior, a, a thinker, a poet, uh, you, you're looking to, to, to develop uh, the full uh, sort of potential of, of a human being. So b- being philosophical means that you're able to look at the world, not with, not through the lens of right and wrong and good and bad and, uh, you know, saint and evil, but rather you're able to, to see the, world as you know a complex experience of consciousness that that requires you to be curious the entire time the the, the questions uh, should you should always be in a state of asking why you know why why do i you know why did i act this way why do i think this way what are the beliefs that drive my thinking why did i make this choice and each person's why is always unique and different. And that's beautiful. That, that's, the, that's the point. Your why is not Danny's why and Danny's why is not my why. You know, why we each get up in the morning is unique. But, and, and why we each make decisions is unique. And that's, 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 but I need a martial artist, a combat, uh, you know, artist, a warrior, a, a, a mover, a thinker. I need this person to be, uh, genuinely, sincerely curious about their why, what drives you, why do you do that? And I can't tell you that your why is right or wrong. I can only get you to stay in that state of mind of, of being willing to question it so that you don't get stuck in this kind of dogmatic thinking that your why is the right why. You know, maybe it's not, you know, uh, let's take Conor McGregor. He's a good example, but since he's a very famous prize fighter, you know, I think uh, if, I, if I compare him to, to say, uh, George St. Pierre, you have two very different fighters. You have two very successful prize fighters, but you have one who's, who's clearly driven more in the direction of being philosophical about their journey as a martial artist and one who's more and one who appears to be driven more in the direction of fame and financial success. And, 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 and that, you know, sort of, sort of the prize of fighting for McGregor appears to be material gain. The prize for fighting for St. Pierre appears to be the development of spirit and self. And you, you can see the difference 
in the way these two live their lives and communicate to the world through their channels of communication, Instagram, whatever it, it may be, they're different. And you can see the difference in them. Yeah, interesting. And I, and I guess that's, that, that does sound like it's a, a much more traditional sort of martial arts mindset that you're talking about there, whereas these days you do tend to see a lot more combat sports. Right. This is my thing. Fuck these days. You know, that's my issue. <laughs> I mean, if I'm being this, like, <laughs> if I'm being honest, this is, you know, I, I'm 52 years old and I think you make the exact point traditional, which is, I mean, you know, the world is heading toward, you know, as fast as we can go right into, you know, into chaos and, 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 and the decay, the gen, the, the genuine decay of, of, of sort of, of quote unquote civilization. And it's fat and we're watching it. We were born at this time. I don't know why, but we're, we're like born, you know, because to be born in, you know, 1800 is not to see this to, to be born now is to watch us. We've peaked. And, and not only have we peaked in terms of what, what, you know, the civilization is peaked. And what I mean by that is, you know, we've, We've produced so much comfort and so much, so much consumption that we've actually, we're actually turning the corner and now populations are, are declining. You know, everyone's aware that we're actually going in the other direction now. There's, there's no recovering. We're not going to live the life we once lived of push a button and stuff just shows up at your door. That is soon going to change and we're going to become you know, the, the world is, you know, geographically, uh, we're going to change uh, from a global economy to more local. You know, things are things are changing. You know, if you're if you're paying attention financially, if you're just if you just read the news, you know, and you understand it's like if you, it's like denying climate change, it, you know, it, it's occurring. And so is globalization. That's changing, too. So everything's about to restructure. And I know this is a philosophical sort of tangent, but the, the, the fight game, martial arts, reflects the change in society the same way that, that, the glo that globalization reflects it, that finance reflects it, that art and culture reflects it. Every art, every culture, part of culture that we that we can witness is showing us the direction we're heading. So fighting is showing us the same direction. There's no more development. We don't expect anything anymore from our martial artists. We used to expect them to be noble and to have moral sort of, uh, to, to take a moral high ground, to sort of stand for something. We don't care about that anymore. The fans just want to see a McGregor type of character who's talking shit doesn't you know, talks about other people's families and, and, and personal, you know, like just makes this whole thing into a, a show. And, and so that, but, but that's not a one-off. That's just one part of the whole. So if you observe what's also happening in music, same thing with music, you know, I, 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 I saw a, a comedian he read the lyrics to, you know, that Christmas song, uh, oh, the, the weather outside is frightful. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 come inside. And, and, and so, so people are like, oh, well, that's a rapey song. I'm like, well, first of all, I, I, that's a stretch. But I know exactly what you're about to say, by the way. Right. I watched the same thing. Right. It's crazy. It was, it was, I have, I have, have you not? Let me explain. It was so amazing, good. right? So he reads the he reads two lyrics. One, uh, as we all know, one one set of lyrics is to what's the top song on the radio at the time. Everyone's complaining about it. It's cold outside as a song, and the comparison of lyrical content is insane. The other song was um, Nicki Minaj, Wet Ass Pussy. So they were trying to get that Christmas song banned right. from being on the radio. But at the same time, Wet Ass Pussy is completely was, was, was the actual like number one at the time. And then he's reading the lyrics from Wet Ass Pussy. And he's like, this is the fucking world we live in. Absolutely crazy. It, it, is, it is fucking nuts though, isn't it? When he reads it out, it sounds absolutely crazy. The Christmas song's basically just asking a girl to come in 
get warm, blah, 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 blah. You know, nothing too he's bad. Flirting. And then he's, he's got his he's fucking flirting. song saying about that. He's flirting. He's trying to, he's yeah. doing what every human's probably ever done in the mating process, which is, hey, what do you think about hanging out with me? Well, it's cold outside. You know? And this chick's like, get in that. I mean, it's insane. But it, it is fucking but insane. But it's okay because it's a female singing it. She's a person of color. <laughs> you know, like we're yeah. supposed to make all yeah. these exceptions because, you know, it, 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 it's – and all I'm arguing right now is that this is – that martial, the world of martial arts is just another sector where we can watch the decay of a certain standard that society once held for these – for these – what I would call these influencers, these leaders, these role models. I've, I've never made that, um, I guess that, that link, but yeah, I think you're onto something there, mate. So what, what is your, so what is your martial arts background? Well, speaking of the traditional thing, I was trained, you know, like most, most guys, my age, I was trained in, uh, you know, Taekwondo and Japanese karate. So I got my first black belt, uh, in uh, Olympic style Taekwondo and uh, which was, you know, uh, I s- trained in a traditional Mudokwan style. Um, and then, it, th- which then transitioned into Olympic style, which has now become like completely sport oriented and lost all of its uh, <laughs> traditional you know style. And, and then I moved into um, a, a style of karate, j- very traditional Japanese karate called Yoshukai, which is from Kitty Kyushu, like the Kyushu islands, um, in, in Japan. It's a very traditional, you st- still training with, uh, n- with, uh, nunchaku and, and, and bows and, and the sai, you know, it's very traditional, uh, and, and, and the katana. So I learned that practice, got my black belt in that system. And then at the same time, when I was learning that system, I was, I was at a studio and I was teaching there, uh, the, I was teaching striking, there, I was teaching the, the karate style. Um, there was a gentleman who was running his uh, his classes out of there named Hicks and Gracie. And he would come in at the end of class and set up his mats. And they would do this thing on the ground in geese that I thought was ridiculous because I was like, why are they wrestling in geese? I don't understand what's happening in front of me. I, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't get it. And it wasn't until I got one of the guys who was training in it, I saw him at the, at the gym and I said, Hey, um, uh, you know, see you at the school after, you know, cause we would close down the, our karate classes and then they would come in and set up the mats. And I said, Hey, you know, if you show me some of this stuff, uh, I'll show you some stand up striking. And he was like, sure. And, and he was just a blue belt and he tapped me about 500 times <laughs> uh, wrestling with him and i was like okay i don't know i don't know what the fuck this is but i like it and it, it, there's clearly a gap you know in in my in my uh game when i go to the ground and that got me on the journey and so i got my blue belt from hickson and then he stopped teaching at the school he was teaching in, in la at, at the wilshire academy because his academy moved from the palisades and to Wilshire. And then I started building Budokan. So I got on the road and I started getting busy. And so eventually I just kept collecting my uh, jujitsu experience over the course of time. And then finally I landed with um, Shanji Hibero and Rafael Lovato Jr. Because uh, I was, I became a part of uh, Rafael's MMA fight team uh, with, uh, with the Bellator when he, you know, he, he became the Bellator champ. I, I became a uh, part of his um, team before that, before we, you know, achieved that goal. And I was a Brown belt and these two guys were like, your jujitsu, you know, I mean, you, you, you've got a, you've got a decent jujitsu game, but it's, it's full of, you know, holes and mistakes and problems. And you're trying to Budokan, the whole time, which was sort of you know, translation. I was, I was out moving people, but I wasn't doing it with proper jujitsu, you know, technique. Yeah. And so, Intent. And so that's what Raphael used to say. I'd say, you know, how do you think I did today? And he'd go, well, you, you know, you, you out Budokan some people today, but you didn't. You know, your jiu-jitsu wasn't very good. 
And so I, 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 and at the time I wasn't really training in the gi, I was training no gi mostly. And they talked me back into putting the gi on and finishing the black belt journey, which I'm so incredibly grateful that they did. And I, uh, it took me, it literally took me about five years uh, to train with them. I almost started over. It really is what it felt like. And uh, to, to really understand jujitsu from the perspective of, of honest, I mean, from world, from legends, world champions, it's just, you know, as they say, there are levels to this game. Well, that's, that's what they mean. You know, you, you, the, the, the level of understanding of the guys at, you know, at that level of achievement. I mean, you're talking about like Shanji as an example, you know, uh, statistics just came out on him. He, he's won more matches at ADCC than anyone has ever won. As an example, no one will ever have. That's crazy. Yeah, he's one. He's so cool. He's, he's beat more people, you know, in inside the ADCC tournament than <laughs> anyone ever has. That's crazy. Yeah. That? Just on its own, that's that's such an achievement. Yeah, it? I mean, it's just it. it you know, it, it's it's crazy. And his brother Salo, who of course is who primarily taught him and taught Rafael. Uh, you know, I mean, his his achievements are stunning you know, as well. So it's, you know, so I definitely, I definitely have a, a privilege, a privilege getting to work with Shanji because I've developed Budokan mobility for jujitsu through Shanji. Uh, when Shanji saw me moving, he was, he was like, you know, I don't know. I don't know if you, you know, he, I didn't realize Shanji was such a movement athlete. I didn't understand that about his game until I started teaching him mobility and realizing, man, this guy can fucking move. Why is he moving so well? He's a huge, he's a huge guy, but his his mobility is is phenomenal. His his IQ, his movement IQ is very high. He's not stiff, he's not lumbering, he's not a big guy moving. He moves like a little guy, which I'm like, okay, now this explains why he was so difficult and why people can't pass his guard why the best in the world can't deal with him it's because he's he's a, you know he's a he's this like a like a like a monkey you know with all this uh, adaptability and 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 sort of range of motion in in his in his joints and his and his in his the way he can transition scaled up to a 210 pound man you know which, you know, in theory, he sh- it's fine if you move like that when you're 135. It's different when you're 210, you know, and, and that's what makes yeah. him so good. Yeah. I, I'm very envious, mate, of the uh, the people that you've trained with. There. I was just about to say that. It's, so, it's such a good start, isn't it? Yeah. It's like the best start you could get. <laughs> yeah. So when you um, when you first came across uh, Hickson back back in the day, what year was that? Was that sort of pre, was that post or pre-UFC? Well, that was 2000. And three, when I was training with Hickson, and at this time, Hickson had fought in Pride. That was his primary, um, yeah, um, you know, promotion that he fought the, you know, under was was Pride in Japan. And were you familiar? Had, had you seen that at, at the point of seeing what they were doing, or was it literally brand new to you? Oh no, yeah, I, I didn't know anything about it. I hadn't seen. I, <laughs> I, I, I didn't. I didn't even know what. I didn't even really know what his. I mean. Mixed martial arts at that time was a very new and sort of undefined and unfamiliar co- concept. And, and it wasn't popular. MMA was not a popular term. I mean, right now, the word MMA is so popularized that I could probably ask, you know, a person who knows nothing about fighting at all do you know what MMA is? Uh, a typical, you know, citizen, uh, they would say, yes, I think that isn't that fighting, isn't that fighting in the cage or whatever that that's, you know, th- that's the difference at that time. It was, you know, uh, it was very, uh, it was a very, uh, you know, unfamiliar world to most people, including myself, who was even a martial artist. I, I wasn't familiar with it so much because I didn't, I don't think I gave it much of, uh, 
I gave it much credit. I think I thought of it as, as not some type of organized system of fighting, but I thought of it as a bunch of guys who are put into a, a, some type of tournament. It, it, you know, I think we thought of it like a, a, a brawl. You know, you take a karate yeah. guy, a boxer, you take a Muay Thai guy and a Kung Fu guy. And and that and, and that's how people thought of mixed martial arts. I think it was though, wasn't it? It was a bit silly at the start. It seemed a bit silly from the outside, didn't it? Like you said, they made it a bit of a spectacle, didn't they? By exactly. by doing that, you well, know, I, they used to have yeah. in Japan. Then they used to have the massive big oh, jack pride, guy, shit, pride, yeah. and then they used to have like a like a five foot six, hundred and sixty pound lad. Oh, you yeah, know, the mismatching was yeah, nice the mismatching, the day, and, yeah. and they used to love it in Japan, though, didn't they? Mm. And and if you think about it, uh, blood sport really popularized. <laughs> That idea, yeah. and somebody said, you know, I mean, I don't know if blood sport was imitating reality or realities started imitating, you know, fit, uh, you know, entertainment. But the bottom line is, what they borrowed from each other for sure. And someone certainly said, this is a great idea. This makes yeah. little sense. The Japanese have been doing that because they love spectacle. And, and, and anyway, which is, you know, the sumo and, and, and I mean, fighting, you know, the Thai, Muay Thai, you know, they've, they've, these cultures have been, have been enjoying combat as a spectacle for a very long time, but still have the Americans or the Western, you know, culture with boxing. I mean, we, we've all been, been doing it, but no one had done it on such a scale. So organized and, you know, you know, in a way that, uh, that that UFC did, the Gracies did, but I think what's important is when you start seeing it from uh, back to the question of of the early days with Hickson is, you know, at the time th there just wasn't. I mean, you, you got to go back and understand there wasn't even YouTube, mm. there, there wasn't social media. You know, so so I had the first the first way that I watched Hicks and fight was a VHS tape that I bought from Hickson's like Hickson had a little store and you could get your gi, you could get your, your, you know, your normal gear. And you could also get a choke. They, they had already you know, made this, you know, and you could, you could watch Hickson fight in this documentary, but it was on VHS tape. Mm -hmm. Class. So it was. <laughs> yeah, That's so weird, isn't it? Yeah. Though, that it was, it was a funny time. I, I, had, I had a similar introduction actually. Um, so I was. I probably got introduced to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in 2007, mm -hmm. and it was similar. I, I boxed growing up, and then I was doing uh, Muay Thai. And at the gym, it's almost identical um, in many ways. But at the gym that I was training uh, Thai boxing at, there was a bunch of guys doing some sort of wrestling, and it, it turned out it was. It was kind of MMA training, so it was a bit of everything, but fundamentally it was Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Sadly, it wasn't Hicks and it was a group of blue belts. Um, and funny enough to your comments about YouTube, we were actually uh, used to work out of the Jiu-Jitsu University book, which we've actually got in our studio um, to, to remind me of the good that old days. Good. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's funny how it's moved on and Danny is is, is found it more recently. So um, you're what, a year and a half in now, I think? And, and I often, I'm often envious because his development has been so rapid compared to how I remember mine back in the day because <laughs> yeah. of yeah. all of the training partners, the resource available now is unbelievable. Yeah, the way so, that yeah, I train, yeah. I mean, my wife is a purple belt and she's very good. And I trained her and I, the, 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 the way that, the way, the, the, the speed at which she's developed, she's so good compare you know in, in such a short period of time compared to where you know i was and what it took um is is a huge difference because even even when i started and, and this has been one of the challenges of jujitsu i mean it's one of the challenges of all system systemized human you know ideas jujitsu being one of them is there's so many different ways of teaching an idea. So a lot of times the, 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 a lot of people, and I don't want to reduce this to just all oh, the Brazilians teach this way or so-and-so teaches this way. People 
so, will oftentimes teach jujitsu through the techniques of jujitsu. So they'll teach arm bars. They'll teach, uh, you know, different submissions, different escapes, different sweeps. But what they don't teach, what they fail to teach is the, con- the, the principal concept of what's occurring. And so what happens is I've learned this technique, which is basically broken into steps or stages. And when there's a moment that happens with me and another person, you know, rolling or, or, or you know, that's the term for those who don't know <laughs> any jujitsu, when you're <laughs> actually sparring, you're rolling. When you're rolling and you, and you, 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 you are trained, you're transitioning, you know, from one you know, position to another. If you wander into territory that is not familiar or part of the step, you know, four step process you learned on something else, you're, you're lost immediately. You don't know where you are because this doesn't look like one of the steps or stages yeah. you were taught. And, and that's because you've been, it's you, you, it, there's a failure in teaching you the concept of, of the game. Like what's the general basic idea here? Like I'm standing in front of you and, and you're on your back. So I'm standing in, and I want to, I want to pass your guard. You're on your back. You're defending from, you know, from an open guard, you're on your back position. What's the general concept here? Well, the general concept is I need to get around your legs. That's the general concept. That's the principle. But instead of being taught from that place, we get taught steps and stages through like, this is the guard pass. You're going to, you're going to take, you're going to grab this leg. You're going to move this leg over. You're going to step here. You're going to do this. That in my opinion is the wrong way to teach jujitsu. It doesn't teach the student the principle of what's occurring and to get them to start thinking for themselves without telling them these are the four stages of, 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 you know, this technique. And then when something, because again, if I'm on my back and my legs are up and I'm taught, let's say uh, something as simple as, uh, you know, a, a, a Torian, a, 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 you know, just a, yeah, sorry, a little fight sorry. pass. Yeah. I'm just going to grab your legs take them to the side and step to the other side. No problem. Well, what happens when the student uh, with the legs entangles my legs in say a De La Hiva? Now I'm standing there. I'm like, wait a second. Uh, it's not, wor- it's not working coach. <laughs> my, yeah, it's not working. Yeah, so, but, but instead of teaching the person that is to say, Hey, Sometimes this guy's going to put his legs here, there, he's going to entangle it. You're, it doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter where he puts his legs. Your job is to get those legs, get, get yourself unentangled from them and get them out of your way. And now, now let's, instead of, let's, instead of working this as a technique, let's work this as an idea. And I don't even want you to know what the fuck to do. What I want you to do is struggle and fail and just try to solve this problem in many different variations. That's how I teach. And that's what I think is the difference between the way I was taught originally because I was taught technique steps and stages instead of principal concepts. I think I'm, I've been really lucky with that though, because we are taught a lot of concepts rather than techniques at times. And a few things that I always think of when I'm rolling is like when Braulio talks about head of the snake, when other people have taught me like get your hips higher than theirs at all times. So if someone's trying to sweep me, I'm trying to make sure yeah, if they were in tarot or whatever and someone's trying to sweep me, I'm like, I'll get my hips higher so they can't sweep me. Little things like that. I always try and stick in the back of my head, like it's rather than worrying about that technique or whatever you know if i'm in side control now i i don't really i don't focus on the hips as much at the moment i'm kind of working towards the head to hold the head because then the hips are just useless like most people's power is from their hips so if i control the head and their their upper arms you know those sorts of things is probably like you said because of the people that are teaching me that uh, now uh, things have moved on so far haven't they compared to what they were like maybe like 10 years ago. Yeah, and I, I think certainly for beginners, I completely agree. I think that's definitely the way to go because yeah. there's, there's too many sort of nuances and technique and detail for, for anybody to, to hold. 
Uh, do, do you think that once somebody's got a good grasp of, of the sort of concepts and the ideas and the movements, that's when you would layer layer it with technique and, and those small details? Exactly. It's like, first, let me make sure they understand their objective. Like, 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 you know, why are you here? We go back. Remember we talked about why being philosophical. We come back all the way to the beginning of this conversation. Like, like, you know, uh, Bob is standing here in front of Tom and I'm like, Bob, why, why, what are you doing right now? <laughs> He's like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm like, exactly. <laughs> so you don't need a technique. What you need is to understand what the fuck you're doing right now. Like, what's your why? You know, why, why are you grabbing his feet? Well, I don't know why I'm grabbing his feet. Well, that's a problem. So let's get clear on our why. Why am I grabbing this guy's yeah. feet? Why am I grabbing that lapel there and not there? You know, why, 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 why? There's nothing more important than the question why for, for, you know, for innovation and understanding. Why is everything, you know, why, you know, every scientist uses that all day long. You know, why is this not working? Why is this working? Why is that doing that when I do that to it? You know, why is the, is the foundation of, of, of science, right? Of, of discovery. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. so yeah, I would, I would always try to get that person in that sort of, you know, way of thinking first and then, but now let's, let's, let's take it over to mobility for a second. Like, like what my sort of, what I'm trying to do to interrupt the, 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 the world of jujitsu. Cause I'm, I'm trying to be a bit of a disruptor, uh, but not because I just want to disrupt, but because I think there's a, an opportunity to improve a blind spot that exists within the jujitsu culture, which is that, Movement is not something that is important to focus on in jujitsu. What we should focus on is more jujitsu. And and what I'm tr what I what, what, what I, I try to explain this with a few different sort of analogies or, or metaphors. One of them is this: if you take two equally great jiu-jitsu practitioners they both know the same information the one who's going to win is the one who is more athletic they're going to be they're either they're stronger they're faster they more you know agile they've got better range of motion they're they're you know they're more explosive the better athlete is always going to win and that's just the nature of nature so, you know, adapt or don't, but this is, this is obviously, uh, we're talking about the, the basic concept of Darwinism right now. We're talking about, you know, <laughs> uh, natural selection. Two, two rams are fighting. The strongest ram will win. Or, you know, or the ram with the most aggression, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, so, so maybe it's a, you know, there's a combination, but in theory, the stronger will win. Okay. So if you've got, this is just one approach. If I want to develop a better, you know, jujitsu athlete, I have to focus on their joints as part of that training. They need, they need to be strong. They need to be flexible. They need to be healthy. If I can't get end to end range on my joints, how am I going to express all of the possibility of the different positions my body needs to be in in order to succeed at the game? Let's, you know, we're going to call it a game. So if it, it, right now my hand is here, if I can't make a completely clenched fist, how am I going to punch something if my hand will only close to this degree? It's not going to. What's the difference if if this is my if this is my hand or this is my hip and I can't get my hip to its full expressed range? You know, I need complete end to end range on all my joints, but I don't just need them to be end to end. I, I, I need to be able to express end to end range because that assumes that I've got flexibility. I also need to be able to push or pull at deep end to end ranges. So if you've got your knee all the way into your chest, 
You know, you're all the way in your chest. Can you push away with the same force you can at mid-range? Because mid-range is where everybody lives right? Everyone lives at mid-range and everyone's got general strength at mid-range because we all work out of mid-range. Think of it like a pull-up. When you go to do a pull-up, it's at the full extension that you've got to exert the most effort to get back up. It's not here at mid-range. If you stop here where you're strongest, you can get back up pretty easy. It's when you go all the way to full in range and then you try to come back up. My job with athletes is to get them to be to express their end range potential. But you can't do that until you unless un, until or unless you spend time there and they don't want to do it. People don't want to be <laughs> deep squats, transitioning, walking around like which which is what a lot of people see me do They're like, you know, you're crawling on the ground all the time. Yes, I'm I'm in I'm at end range. And I'm mobile at end range on purpose. So in other words, I get into end range positions like a squat and I force people to walk or locomote end at their end range position because that's where you, that's the only way to express that. Otherwise, what you do is there's another approach. You can lay on your back. And you can do, let's say, a leg press. You're on a, 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 a leg press machine. You can bring your knees all the way to your chest and push out, right? We've all seen those, a leg press machine in a gym. You can do that. Of course, that's going to make you strong, but only on one plane. It's only going to be forward and pushing away. But jujitsu requires all kinds of variations of planes, you, your, your knees are t- everything. The angles are, you know, unlimited. You know, there's so many varieties. So you need to have people constantly working from these end range positions, working the variety of possibility of locomotion and transition and, and working through, you know, their weight. So that's one idea. The second idea is that if I take a room full of people, Usually I've got, if I'm doing a seminar, I have, let's say I have 40 uh, guys in the room. They're all a variety of different belts and ages and, and, and girls too, you know, girls and guys. And I go, okay, so guys, who in this room thinks you're going to do jujitsu for the rest of your life? Most people raise their hand. Most people in the room raise their hand, you know? So I go, okay. I go, all right. So 99% of the room thinks you're going to do jujitsu the rest of your life. Let's try this. How many people in this room are 20 to 30 years old? You know, most of the room does this. Okay. How many people are, you know, 40 to, you know, 30 to 40 and then less people do this. <laughs> and then you now I get to, I get to 40 to 50, less people. And then I get to 50 to 60 uh, well, there's two people and I get to, you know, 60 to 70. There's no one or one person. I go, is anybody watching the math on this? Because what we have here is a complete contradiction to to the, the to what just occurred, everyone's going to do jujitsu the rest of their lives in here. But there's only one guy in here who's 60 years old. Is anybody? Does anyone see the problem here? Is that no? I said, let me give you guys. Let me give you guys a reality check. You're going to do jujitsu until it hurts too much, and then you're going to stop. And and if you look in this room, most people stop in their 40s. And, you know, so you're in your 30, you're 20 to 30. Oh, yeah, there's a bunch of people in the room. 30 to 40, less. But, for, but you know, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, it just keeps declining because your body can only take this kind of punishment. Punish, f- fine. <laughs> let's, let's call it that. You can only take this kind of punishment for so long. And, and now – Now, compound that with the fact that these people aren't stretching, they're not recovering, they don't understand their bodies well, they don't know how to put themselves in proper positions when they are doing things. So they get their joints torqued and they tear this and they tear that because, you know, somebody who doesn't really have great awareness of body mechanics is suddenly doing something that requires a lot of 
a understanding of, of, of architecture. Like, you know, just the, let's take something as simple as the concept of the De La Hiva. You're standing there. Someone wraps, entangles your leg with their leg. And then uses their other leg to, you know, drive you back or, or disturb, you know, they're di so one leg's entangling, the other is disturbing your other base leg. And I'm, and I'm standing here with this going on and I'm an accountant. You know, <laughs> I work at an office building. I don't know the fuck, how the fuck do I know what to do with this? And so I, you know, I torque to the left. I turn. I, I do. I make some explosive movement this way or that way. And you know, my knees are getting slowly damaged, or 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 it's you know an acute injury. Boom! Right on the moment, you know something big, or it's just slow little tears that I'm creating because I don't understand my own architecture and what I need to do to preserve and protect my positioning and my joints. And I'm, I'm sacrificing with every moment, little things and little things are getting aggravated and little tears are created and all this. And, <laughs> and, and by the time I get to 45, my shit is done. My knees are done. My, my joints have taken, and again, it's cumulative. It doesn't even have to be, this, you know, one, one, again, acute moment, which does happen too, of course, but it's oftentimes the compounding experience of little bad decisions that, I, that where I'm sacrificing because I, I want it so bad. I, you know, I want this moment. I want, I'm not going to let this person do it. Fuck that. Fuck that. Dinner. And all those little compounded decisions slowly tear away at your connective tissue specifically your ligaments, not your tendons, because your tendon has a lot of vascularity. It's got a lot of blood flow. It can heal quickly, but your ligaments do not heal like that. They have very little, if no blood flow at all. So they don't heal well. And that's why you have to have surgery. So they got to go in and, you know, uh, they got to anchor this ligament back to the bone because, you know, because it, it won't, it's not going to, you know, these things aren't designed oftentimes to heal themselves in the body. That's just not how ligaments work. So, so if it, I, I'm just trying to break down the, the problem so that the, the listener understands what is, what's your thesis here? The thesis is that people slowly injure themselves over the course of their 10, 15, 20 year jujitsu career. And by the time they hit 20 years in the game, they're done. Their joints are, are, you know, and it only takes one joint for you to stop doing jujitsu if it's your shoulder, if it's your knee, if it's your wrist, you're like, I can't do jujitsu anymore. It hurts too much. It just takes one joint. One joint that, that you're in too much pain. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I'm um, I'm knocking on the door of, of 20 years. Not, not constant training, but certainly started 20 years ago and have been in and out. And I'm also within that age now. I'm, I've just turned 41. And interestingly, I, I had a, a, bit, a bit of time off because of one joint, which was my elbow. Um, so you're absolutely right. What I did find is is that I have been able to, I guess, reposition my mind about, I guess, my why and why I'm training and and therefore my approach to training. And, you know, on that, my decisions is well when training. So, you know, if I'm rolling with Danny, who's seven years younger and he's maybe got a fresher jiu-jitsu body, um, arguably a bit stronger, you know, when we're rolling in certain positions, I whereas in the past I may have battled through that, I tend not to anymore. So, yeah, I, I, I'm very aware of what you're saying. Um, I guess the question on that is, I mean, you know, can a, a kind of stiff, middle-aged, you know, person, guy who is getting into jiu-jitsu, can they regain that, that mobility? And I, I know certain um, cumulative damage to the body is, as you say, is, is maybe only correctable with surgery and intervention. But maybe someone who's a little bit newer on their journey, but but still of that age, do you feel that you know they they can regain some of that former glory in regard to mobility and and body and 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 sort of experience that longevity on the mats? Well, yeah, I think they absolutely can. You know, again, if they if they start taking their recovery seriously, and that's what and that's what my my primary focus is is recovery. That's what I teach. You know, I'm teaching a person how to, well, I mean, I wouldn't say that's the 
the entirety of the work, but the bulk of the work is how to, you know, maintain the machine and keep it running well. But then also in, in, in conjunction with that, you also need to make sure you're not hurting the machine at the same time. So in other words, a mechanic on a race car can look at the driver and go, Hey, I can fix these problems, but if you keep driving the car like that, we're just in a loop. So I need you to stop doing this, which is producing that and, and, and be smarter. So let me go back to your elbow for a second. Did you learn to modify a little bit in order to, to protect your elbow? Yeah. So, um, I, I, side control escapes is a really good example. So I don't tend to hip escape anymore, um, because it, it aggravates my elbow to frame. So I, I tend to sort of go more for sort of, you know, dig into underhooks and go for ghost escapes and that type of thing. Okay. So imagine that your entire body is injured like this. And what you're doing is you're, you're creating a game where you're not putting your joints under so much stress and negative tension. Whatever. Ever. Because, because you don't need to. It's not necessary. Because if you, there's a way to do everything in the body that's efficient and and efficiency is an important word. Efficient means to get the job done with as least amount of effort possible to be efficient. But also at the same time, effective. Efficiency and, and, and efficacy have to be coupled together because if it's efficient, but it's not effective, what's the value? So obviously I need to do something that gets the job done, but does not cost me, you know, position or, or whatever. So imagine that you're learning, uh, you know, we're talking about as an example, uh, Paul's talking about framing, you know, and, and, and he's here like this and he's like, okay, you know, when I frame, it hurts to, be, to, to bear resistance on this arm. So instead I underhook and I look for back positioning by, by swimming that under and I don't have to bear all that drive into that joint. Totally understood. There's also understanding the frame, the the, the, uh, the architecture that, as an example, if you push into my elbow, you're driving into my shoulder. If you push into my hand, you're driving into my elbow. So Paul's saying, you know, I don't like when that force gets applied to my arm. I don't mind this force. I can handle this force. So if Paul actually, if Paul modifies his frame so that he's using his elbow more than he's using this part, that this joint doesn't take all of that. So then a lot of the modification can just occur by changing the architectural structure of, 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 of ultimately you're thinking of your body, uh, uh, like a like an architectural frame, so there's a pillar, and the pillar has leverage. So you know, um, uh, obviously, uh, 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 leverage is you know up top down. This is great leverage, which is why we see in buildings pillars. You know, are here when a pillar does that. Uh, not so. You know, that's a lot of force with with very little um, leverage to uh, upwards here. So Paul's frame changes from this to this. Now his elbow's doing more of the framing and he can protect this joint a little bit better and that, and still swim under and get his, you know, get his underhooks and his back takes. I mean, this is how you preserve joints and, but, but at the same time still play the game exactly as it should be played. You have to frame, you have to block, you know, there's no other way to do it. You've got to keep people, but there's a way to use your joints and position them so that they have, uh, they don't take the force of a 225 pound guy, which is often the case, right? We've got these big guys that are driving, you know, your, your problem's not a 145 pound rooster <laughs> weight fighter who's, who's trying to you know pressure pass you. 
The problem is that 215, 20 pound guy who's driving, you know, he's into you. And, and so the more that we learn to align, and this is going to be my second point after the first point I made about uh, age and injury and, and the de- deterioration of joints, was going to be this conversation around proper alignment of, a, of joints, proper architecture of the body so that I can, I can prevent all the wear and tear on the joints. There's no reason my elbow has to get to the point that I can't use it anymore B- because had I used it from the beginning properly, I wouldn't have created all that inflammation and aggravation and pain and damage to the components of the joint that I'm now having to pay the price for. But that's all healable. That's all fixable. And I can change all that. What, what, it, what it really needs is it needs to recover, you know, I mean, you know, and it's not going to stop until you treat the whole body properly. Because by the way, if this hurts, a lot of people will start doing things like, okay, they're stretching this, they're resting this. What they don't understand is the, the, the way the body works as, as an organism for, with, with soft tissue is it's, it's like a, the, the myofascia is covering all of the, the right, all of the muscular system. So you've got a connection across, you know, across all the lines and throughout, and, and, you know, so, so everything's pulling on everything. And most people, instead of stretching more and doing more yoga, which means that they're, 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 they're creating freedom throughout the entire structure and frame, they'll hyper-focus on the area of discomfort or injury or pain. And what you'll find is if your elbow is hurting from this, by stretching the whole front line and everything, you, this will start getting relief because what's happening is everything's getting shorter and shorter and shorter. This whole, this, all this is shortening up. This is now shortening up. And this, so, so this guy is taking the tension of the entire front line and cross, you know, so it's, 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 you know, and, and I can't tell you how many athletes don't want to stretch. I cannot tell you how many of these guys don't want to do yoga. I'm a, I'm a bit of a nightmare for it, Cam. Like I do, I, I'm, a, I'm a personal trainer by trade, and I do do stretching. But there's so many times where I'll do a little warm up and then get off the mats and have a shower, and that's me done. You know, I'm real, I'm real bad with that. Yeah, I find that a lot of people just almost triage it in the sense that they go right. I've got limited time, so I've got my skills acquisition. I've got my you know, maybe your cardio is part of that. I've got my strength training, which a lot of people put a lot more stock into from a re or prehab perspective. I got to make food. I've got to, yeah, I, yeah. You know, I mean, like all the things that go into being, you know, to, to, to taking care of yourself. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the problem is that stretching, and I just, you know, I want to say this, and I really want everybody to hear it. Stretching is as it's equally important to stretch the body the same amount of time you have strengthened the body. You, 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 to think that you're going to, I want you to wrap your head around this, to think that you're going to misbehave like in, posturally for 12 hours a day, like you're going to sit in a chair, you're going to be slumped over, you're going to look at your phone, you're going to be like this, and that you're going to do 15 or 20 minutes of stretching and that's going to correct all of this of 12 hours of postural positioning that you're going to correct all this with 15 minutes of this. It's not going to fucking happen. It's, it's a fantasy in your head. You have to stretch constantly. If you're going to be strengthening that much. So if you do an hour or an uh, uh, let's say you do an hour to two hours, whatever of, of, of strength training, and then you do an hour or whatever and a half to two hours of jujitsu, you basically just did three to four hours of strength training. Jujitsu is strength training. So you, you do, you got that, 
plus, plus, you know, <laughs> this, and then you think you're going to do 15 minutes of some, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's, I mean, are you crazy? <laughs> you know, so, so, so that, that's why I work with professional athletes because professional athletes, as much as they're oftentimes resistant to stretching, but, but yoga is yoga is part of yoga is stretching. But what's important to understand is that it's, it's like saying this, it's like saying, you know, I, I, I do, I do some martial arts because you do 15 minutes of this. <laughs> so you, 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 you <laughs> pop around the room, punching in the air a little bit and doing some kicks and some knees. And for 15 minutes, you shadow box around the room. And then you say you do martial arts. So if you do some half-ass stretching for 15 minutes and say you do yoga, that's absolutely not true. Yoga is a system of movement. It's a practice. It's the same thing as saying, well, I'm a, you know, I, I do Muay Thai because you bop around the room for 15 minutes kicking the air and punching. It's the same thing. You're either going to take your stretching seriously as a system or you're going to treat it like you're treating you know, your, your pretend, your pretend Muay Thai practice, <laughs> you know, it's. So would you do, would you, so say for example, me, I do five sessions of uh, strength training a week. Would you say I would match another five sessions of stretching or would you say do two half hour sessions of stretching? Two, at least two serious, at least two serious sessions, because here's the thing, Danny, you're not, you're not look. You're not trying to win a UFC title, so the reality is is that you're not a professional fighter who has the let's call it the privilege of getting to train all day. So that your job is literally doing that. So yeah, you can do four hours of intense you know physical training in the morning and then go do an hour of good solid you know yoga practice at night. Like that's your job versus you're a normal human being you can't you can't do it you've got to be patient and say to yourself i'm in this game for life you're in no hurry it's better for you to divide up your training and tr like here's the question do you want to train do you want to train harder and shorter or do you want to train more uh, more with more diversity for longer so in other words, it might take you, if you do two, if you do two less jujitsu classes a week because you traded them for yoga, it may take you a little longer to get to your black belt. Let's just say that's your goal, but you'll get to your black belt in a fucking great, healthy body, or you want to get to your black belt wrecked such a good point no no it's, a, it's such a good point because uh, so many people that i know that have done jiu-jitsu for a long time their bodies are fucked and they oh. kind of me a bit there yeah <laughs> but there's other people at the gym and stuff it's you know that are, that are higher belts and brutal. and you see them and, and they can't move can they you know they can't move they got bad knees bad backs bad ears. it's bad not backs. gentle it's and not again, gentle that's not the, 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 the that's a mislabeling of or misunderstanding <laughs> it, the gentle part means i'm not punching you in the face the gentle part doesn't mean that wrestling is easy. It means I'm not punching you in the face. That's the gentle way. You know, I'm instead of beating you to death, I'm going to squeeze you. I'm going to choke you. I'm yeah, gonna, I'm going to choke yeah, you to death instead. Put you, yeah. put you to sleep. <laughs> put you to sleep. And, that's, and by the way, that is gentle compared to punching you until you're unconscious. So th that's the understanding. So... I, 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 this is what I'm trying to get, you know, you guys is again, professional athletes can fit a yoga class in because they have the time. The, 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 the normal martial artist who's just a journeyman, they just, they're, they're, they're and which is beautiful. I mean, that's the point needs to divide their training up in equal manner and understand that, there's no rush. You're going to do this forever. Well, where are you going? 
Where, what are you trying, where are you trying to get to? I got my black belt at 51 years old. I started when I was 31. It took me 20 years, not because I was lazy or whatever, but because I was busy developing myself in other ways. I was developing my yoga practice, my mobility practice, but all that has paid off in different ways because look at me now, my career, you know, is, is this, and I'm also a black belt and I also (laughs) have, and, and I also have an incredible healthy body. I was about to say, how is your body? Well, don't you see me move? I do see you move. Yeah, very well. <laughs> right. So, so I mean, that's, that's how my body is because you couldn't do that if your body was beat up because you see what people do. When you watch jujitsu guys move, when they're injured, when they're beat up, you see it in the way they walk, the way they just move from place to place. You see it in their jujitsu because it gets l- less acrobatic, less dynamic. It gets more... It gets that what we call that old man jujitsu. You start you start getting real conservative in what you do. You play lockdown games. You start, you try to reduce. You play old man jujitsu, mate. You're not even old. <laughs> I am old. <laughs> try to reduce old. movement. Blah blah blah. So what I'm saying is my jujitsu is excellent because my body is still in excellent shape. And at 52 years old, I still roll with 20 year olds fully, fully dynamic fully acrobatic full, yeah, because I can, you know, I'm, I'm, I have the, I have the, the again, I have the, the, the health and the vitality because I eat and I sleep and I do everything in service to being a healthy human being that I yeah. can still show up on the mat with a 20 year old and give them a fun game, you know? So, these are the important these are the important elements to think about from the big picture philosophical do you want to get your black belt what co- what condition do you want to arrive at your black belt in no that's great mate and th- there was a point there where i was yeah I, I think i was as 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 a bit of a hobbyist um was struggling for a moment to try and grasp how i can fit it all in but i think coming back to the why again and, and where I want to be as a black belt, that makes way more sense. So thank you. Um, you, you your first point that you made um, previously was, was around sort of building that end range strength. Um, and and we, we've kind of touched on obviously jujitsu being a form of strength training. Um, do you, do you kind of recommend like a like external or additional strength training or, or weight training? Um, or is it more sort of body weight movements that you would typically encourage when you when you think about that particular end range strength? Well, I think that you start with what you're calling body movements, which would be uh, making sure that you can carry your body's weight without artificial weight and being being in the form of you know a kettlebell or another person. First, that you can carry your own body weight skillfully. And efficiently, properly, uh, across the floor, across the ground, in different ways, you can carry you. And then, once you can carry you, and you are able to move you uh, with with, and you start to feel light. That that that's this. That, that's what you're looking for. Is this the feeling of uh, you know? I'm starting to like. It's like a pull up. When a pull up gets light. It's time to add weight or, or it's time to add volume. You know, I'll just do more mm-hmm. or I'll throw on a weight vest and I'll, you know, do a pull up with 10 pounds on my, my body, but not until it feels light. Yeah. Because why would I do it? If it doesn't feel light, it doesn't make any sense. So if I'm crawling across the ground and it feels fucking labor intensive and heavy. Why am I going to try to do that with another person on my back? I can't even do it with me. So Mm. you begin with your own body weight and then you work in the direction of adding 
weight again once it feels light yeah no good thank you and just just going back to i guess the sort of thinking about the recovery and the stretching and everything else i think another reason that people don't do it is because it's boring because the idea of sitting there and holding a static stretch for many people is boring um but a lot of what i see you do is obviously it's flow movement so when you talk about that mobility work and you know, and the stretching, if you want to call it that. I mean, what does that typically look like? Is it is it flowing movements or is it static stretching? What's the approach for, for recovery, would you recommend? I mean, you know, they, they've done some interesting uh, clinical research on stretching and they were comparing dynamic stretching with static stretching. And what they found was that they neither produced anything greater than the other. They had an equal success rate uh, you took a per, you know they they so what so so the, the takeaway is it doesn't matter if you're stretching dynamically which meaning that you're there's movement within the stretch or you're holding the stretch it's doing the same thing i like dynamic stretching because i think it produces other qualities that aren't present in static stretching, which is, uh, as an example, I'm teaching my soft tissue to be used to movement at these end ranges. I'm not teaching my tissue that we go to end range and we just hold. I'm teaching my tissue that we go to these in ranges and then there's movement there. There's there's that means there's going to be that tissue is going to be asked to resist and hold while at the same time stretching and giving. But it's there's going to be there's going to be some uh, expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction, because that's ultimately what is, you know is is happening, isn't it? Like the first moving, the first moving creature on the planet, I believe that that you know one one of the first was the jellyfish, was this 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 creature that learned to do this before there was anything. There was a spine, there was you know there was skeletal structure. Anything. This thing learned to do this to move. So so there's something very important about expansion, contraction. It, in, when it comes to locomotion. So that's what I love about moving inside of tight spaces is that I'm teaching my body that that's what you, you, you know, that's wrestling, that's fighting, that's combat. It's not that you just, you just stop here. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think when, especially if people are doing something like jujitsu and they can, they can almost, they can link the movement drills that they're doing and the flows that they're doing to, to obviously the application of the art or, or the system they're using. I think they're more inclined to, to probably do it. I think it's this idea that people have in their head that, you know, they have to just sit down and just grab the hamstrings and have a stretch and sit there for 30 seconds and do that three times and work your way through the body. I think that's what puts people off. But I think if people are actually moving through flows and, and keeping it dynamic, it's much more likely that people would, would adhere to that, I think. Yes. And, and if I get, let me, let me, let me try this as an idea. Natural selection is real. And this means that everybody that starts jujitsu is not fated to finish. Only, only the, the most intelligent will arrive at the, at, at the finish line. And I'm going to call the finish line 80, you're 85 years old and you can still get on the mat. Only the smartest and the most adaptable of the species will arrive at that place. And that might be so few human beings, but that's how it goes. So I don't, I don't, I don't see everyone getting there because th that, that, that would make the assumption that everyone is smart enough to get there, but they're not. And, and they're in there right now. I'm going to, I'm, you know, somebody's going to listen to this podcast and they're either going to take this information and apply it or they're going to go, ah, eh, you know, 
that that's cool. That's interesting, but I don't have time for that. You know, that, that I, I'm not I'm not saying I don't believe the guy, but I, that's not my life. It's not going to work. That guy is going to be finished with jujitsu between forty and fifty, and that's fine. You know what? That that's how it goes. And maybe, by the way, who am I philosophically to say that that's right or wrong? You know, who am I to say that that that, that everyone should finish? Jiu-jitsu. What I'm saying is everyone can if they train correctly. I mean, we've all seen that lady on Instagram or that guy on Instagram who's on the calisthenics bars at 80 years old or 85 still doing stuff. And we're all like, man, that's amazing. Well, you know, that guy is an anomaly, is an outlier. That lady is an outlier. There's not going, they're not, there, there aren't thousands of that lady. And, and that's the reality. So you got to make a decision if you want to be that person now because, and have, and have the, uh, the, have the ability to see far enough forward to say, again, you know, another perfect analogy or, or is most people will never have wealth. Why? Because they don't have the discipline to invest and tell and save and, 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 and properly apply the, 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 the wealth that they get to build greater wealth. And, and the, the same thing's happening right here. This wealth is specific to your health. This is your health wealth, right? So most people will not invest properly. They will not do the right work because they don't have the discipline. They would, they'll choose other things. They'll choose the new this and the new that and the pleasurable this and the pleasurable that over the discipline of taking their money, putting it here, doing that and being conservative when they need to be, being frugal when they need to be. They, they're not going to do it. And so they're going to trade a moment of glory for five more years of of a, you know, of a good practice of, of struggle. <laughs> you know, exactly. So yeah, a moment of glory being they'll do something, you know, from pride and ego and damage something rather than go, you know what? I'm just going to tap. No problem because I'm not going to hurt my me just so I can say I, I, I did what that I, I, I didn't let this 20 year old blue belt tap me. So I, I fought the, the ankle or the, the knee because of my pride all this is poor wealth management and this person will never be wealthy. So it's the, it, this is the perfect analogy for, for your jujitsu. It's like, do you want to be a millionaire in jujitsu when you turn 80? Well, you need to start investing now and start being disciplined now, start making good decisions now. Yeah. I absolutely love that analogy. It's great. Yeah, that's great. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking about health, Obviously, a, a big link to physical health is, is mental health. Um, and, and certainly when we're talking about philosophy and, and decision making and purpose and finding your why. I mean, I know this is probably similar in the in the US, but in the UK, you know, men's mental health is a real issue. Um, I think in the UK, it's the bit, suicide is now the biggest killer in men under 50. And we've had a number of guests on, you know, from all walks of life. But it seems that jujitsu jiu and, and martial arts, I think, seem to have a special special ingredient somewhere that, that seems to support people or men in particular with, with their mental health and, and can really get them through some dark times and struggles. And I just think about what we talked about at the very beginning where you talked about, I guess, the, the, us losing some of the traditional values and, and moving more towards, you know, sort of combat sports and prize fighting. I mean, what are your thoughts, I guess, firstly on on sort of the the kind of headspace of, of men in, in 2023 and, and also the impact of of martial arts and are we at danger of losing that do you think well when we come back to the question of why why are men struggling because that's the first point to address yeah they're, they're struggling because they're, they're they're missing their tribe they're missing rite of passage they're missing community they're missing all the, the, the qualities that are necessary to develop themselves, you know, as a part of something 
more than themselves. And now we've never been more isolated, though we have more connection, <laughs> the irony of it all, right? <laughs> with, with all the connection we have, why are we so isolated? Because it's not real connection. It's, it's I mean, okay, l- let, me, let me reframe. It is a version of connection. But so is McDonald's a version of food. <laughs> you know, so th- th- given that that's a huge problem, most people are eating McDonald's in terms of their social connections. They're not b- eating nutrition, you know, really n- nutritious food, which is men coming together wrestling each other and pretending to kill each other and sitting around after and talking about their lives. And, you know, like, like that's the beauty of a jujitsu school is, is the male bonding experience. And it's necessary and it's important. And it could be through jujitsu. It could be through kite surfing. It doesn't matter. It's men doing things together and accomplishing things together and sort of competing and feeling and, 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 and expressing and, 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 you know, like, like being, uh, getting the experience of, of cooperation together. Men need to cooperate with each other. It's, it's in our DNA. It's what we do. So if you've got no one to cooperate with, to commune with, to build with, you feel super fucking isolated because you're not cooperating and communing with your wife and your kids. That's different. And it's nothing, I mean, that's also a, a, a part of it, but it's not, it's not the thing, you know, the, the, the other component. So that's why I think men are lonely. And it's also why I think jujitsu is so important because it's, again, it's not the answer. It's an answer. And, and it's beautiful. It's just one of the ways that we can come together and, and, and have that experience, I think, of tribe. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good summary of, of the situation, mate. And then going back to the second part of the question, which was around those traditional values. Um, from what you've said, it, it doesn't sound like you believe that would necessarily have an impact, but perhaps does it add more? So if you have a, an academy that is strong in its traditional values versus one that is more focused around prize fighting. You still get many of the things that you just talked about, but do you feel that there would be more to gain from that traditional valued school? Oh, I, I have no doubt. As an example, Killcliffe is one of the, the the teams that I that I'm part of of, of working with their athletes. Killcliffe is uh, Henry Hoof. Uh, they have um, uh, you know Gilbert Burns and and Robbie Lawler and uh, you know. Uh, Michael Johnson. I mean, they have a lot of. I fucking love Gilbert Burns. He's like my favorite. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah, so, so yeah, they have they have a lot of these guys. And one thing that's really important that they do over there is that they have a very strong Christian uh, base. Uh, it was culture within. I mean, I, I use this term loosely, but they're they have a, a relatively spiritual space. Now, now you don't walk in and there's, you know, no one's, no one's um, attempting to convert you to their belief system because there are also Muslims in there. You know, there, there, there are guys who come, uh, one of the guys from China, uh, obviously he's probably a Buddhist, if maybe even atheist, it doesn't matter, but there's a strong kind of, you know, spiritual vibe that kind of goes on in there. You know, me, I'm agnostic. It doesn't matter to me. I, I, I was raised a Christian, but for, for me, I, I'm not, I'm not religious, but I can see the, I can see the value of having a certain cultural collective mindset. When you get a group of people together, I can also see the danger in that too i.e. Hamas, (laughs) you know, I mean, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, Example, any extremist organization that believes in an idea 
but but when it, but okay, but but here's the thing: when an extremist organization believes in an idea, look at what that produces, both good and bad. For, or, and again, I say good and bad being very again abstract terms. Let's say that if we don't use good and bad as a you know as a measure, let's just say that people that believe in things strongly produce more than people who don't believe in anything. Yeah. There's something very powerful about, about, you know, extreme belief, you know, dogmatic belief, um, or, you know, even, even, I would even argue casual belief, but, but belief itself drives human behavior. So when people believe in a singular idea or a singular cause that they can come together and, you know, cooperate with each other and commune and, and, and sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, collectively act in a direction, it's very powerful. So the culture, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a school, you know, it, it does have an effect. So if the culture is being philosophical, that's going to have impact like my school. It's, you know, the, the culture is a philosophical approach to life that, that creates a culture within the school. No doubt. If you have a Christian angle, it creates a culture within the space. No doubt. If it's a Muslim angle, I mean, look at Khabib and his, and his team. I'm sure all of those guys being Muslims, Islamic by faith, I'm sure that had an impact on the fact that they weren't out partying, they weren't out drinking, they weren't out fucking around, they were training, and they were training, and they had smash, that fit, <laughs> and they had their faith to keep them disciplined, so they could put in that that work where other guys weren't, and I think we can all see how that paid off. So it's still paying off for that. Like, well, 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 but, 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 you know, and we can also see too how that, that thinking can also produce other results in, in people. It's, it's, you know, and again, without using the metrics of right and wrong or good and bad, some, you know, uh, you know, sometimes we, you know, the, the direction that people go produces an outcome that has this, uh, you know, this effect on, on other people that, you know, we, we would as a society, you know, we would um, define as uh, negative, as, 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 um, as uh, you know, bad or wrong. Um, and, and, you know, being objective about things and saying, well, there's no right and wrong. Well, that's true, but that's only from the perspective of the universe. In other words, nature doesn't work off binary ideas such as rights and wrongs. That's why you see a lion eat a lion cub. Like if you ever, you know, if, if you watch nature channel, you know, sometimes you see some horrific shit like watching a, a male adult <laughs> lion a, yeah. attack and murder, kill, you know, a, a lion cub, an, an innocent little cub, because it cannot have this uh, cub from another, you know, another male uh, uh, grow up and, you know, and, and test it, you know, right? So, so we watch this and we go, man, that's pretty brutal. But what we realize is that the universe doesn't operate off rights and wrongs. It just it just operates off of action and what you know and 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 what we all understand as this uh, circular you know uh, circular flow of life. Things eat you know this eats that and that eats that and that eats that and it just keeps balancing itself. Humans have a system of ethics and morals based off what we believe is right and wrong. So a human would look at an adult lion eating a cub 
and be horrified by that and say that is morally unacceptable. But that is not. And and if we interfered with that, if we stopped every male lion from eating a lion cub when they took over a pride or did what they did, we would completely disrupt the entire ecosystem of lions. So, So humans would love to constantly apply our moral codes and systems and in thinking to, you know, to the entire, you know, natural world around us. And, and, and we have, and by doing so fucking everything up. And that's, yeah, I agree. <laughs> so we are fucking everything. That's up. what we love to do. We love to go in and say the way we do this is the right way. And the way they're doing it is the wrong way. And there must be something wrong with that thing. If it's doing it that way. Versus being just an objective witness to what's occurring and saying that is the way. And, and, and so, so the universe doesn't operate off rights and wrongs. Humans do. And that's why it's always subjective. But, but our belief in right and wrong is so powerful, it can drive us to become, you know, Hitler's or the Dalai Lama or Jesus or Muhammad or Martin Luther King. I mean, you know what I mean? All these things are driving us to become, you know, these, these versions of what a, you know, what a human can be and, and how can, and, and to say one of them is right and one of them is wrong. They're just examples of how a human can express and manifest a belief. And it's all based on religion a lot of times as well, isn't it? Yeah. Among other things. I mean, that's yeah. what philosophy, but that's what philosophy wrestles with on a daily is yeah. wrestling with the idea of what is right and what is wrong. What is, what are these, what are these notions that we create and how do you, how do you operate within society? Understanding that you, you know, nature has one perspective, but humans have another, but it, the, but the further we take ourselves away from nature, the bigger problem we produce. Yeah, I wanted to ask what what amount of stock you put in, I guess, other other sort of things in regards to recovery. So we obviously talked about the, the movement. You just mentioned nature. Um, obviously, Hickson was, you know, very well known for his breathing and his breath work back in the day. Um, and then, you know, you've got a, a, a current trend of things like ice baths and and cold plunges and that type of thing. Holistically speaking, you know, what, what, what else do you kind of value other than, you know, being part of a tribe, eating well, you know, moving well, but what else, what else do you really value in order to, to maintain optimal health and, and mental health as well? Well, consumption and well, two, two things come to my mind. Number one, consumption. What are you consuming? What are you consuming in, in your daily life? What are you consuming visually? What are you consuming through, uh, th- th- you know, what are you listening to? What are you watching? What are you taking in, uh, you know, again, with, with your mouth through nutrition? Um, cons- you, can, you can understand humans, you know, maybe, maybe 90, maybe 98 percent of the entirety of the human experience can be understood through the view from the lens of consumption. Right. Like yeah, when you yeah, think yeah. about what you consume, what, what media you consume, what literature you consume, what art you consume, what music you consume, what food you consume, what you are taking in, you should be very, very, picky. You should be very wise about what you consume because it's all compounding in your nervous system. It's all compounding in your tissue, all the toxins, the poisons, the things it's all compounding and it's creating cancer. It's creating this, the amount of sugar you take in the amount of, you know, uh, process this process that, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, concentrated, uh, this concentrated that all of that is consumption. And then you want to, you want to 
ask yourself, how clean am I? How healthy am I? I'll, I'll tell you that by, by seeing what you consume. That's how I'll know. I just, I just walk around with you for a few days, watch you consume. And I'll be like, well, <laughs> I, can, I can tell you what's going on here. You know? Yeah, so, no, that's, that's true. Uh, when you say consumption, my, my mind immediately went to nutrition. Um, food and, and drink but of course you're, you're absolutely right in regard to the the information you consume is very important as well it's an interesting point i think it's social media no? yeah social media has got to be the biggest thing at the moment i find myself doing it all the time and i've got to try and check myself even now where i'm where i'm working on this and editing and bits and pieces i find myself like i'll just i don't know casually click at instagram go on a real flick flick before i know it, i've like you know, I can't even watch a film properly sometimes because I'll I'll start watching a film, I'll get a bit, little bit bored and then I'll be, oh yeah, I'll just look on my phone for something or someone will text me or something. Well, and then before I know it, I'm, I've not watched the film, I'm ending up 30 minutes for, for looking through reels and I think, what the fuck am I doing? Well, I do, I think yeah. to myself, like, what the fuck am I doing? I need to put it down and then, Danny, I, I, you know, even in my downtime, I'm not having downtime. Danny, I would, I would offer this thought which would be because I, I feel you and I relate to you a hundred percent. I would, I would offer the thought of whatever you're doing, do it with all of you. So if you're watching a movie, watch the fucking movie, like watch, yeah. watch the movie. Do you know, honestly, that's what I was like. Yeah. Like, it was yeah, yesterday the day before I was exactly like that. I was like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Like I've got the attention span now where I can't sit here on my own and watch a fucking film without picking up my phone and scrolling for a reel or trying to work or whatever it is. I was thinking, no, can you, can I not, I'm not uh, incapable now of doing that. Well, you just, you know, because I used to be able to watch a film fine. You know, I used to sit there, phone in the drawer. Yeah. I remember 10 years ago, I, I bought myself a Nokia 3310 on purpose. So I had no internet and I had that for about 18 months. I couldn't even imagine that now. Do you know what I mean? I purposely got that because I was like, I can't be asked with phones. Internet does my head in, blah, 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 blah. And, and I, I lived like that for a long time, having this shit ass phone and everyone used to take a piss, but it was funny. But now I, I couldn't even imagine doing it. And, it. and that pisses me off. That really does fuck me off that I'm in that loop of just fucking watching this shit all the time. And I think, I think a good, again, not to be the, the guru of solutions because, hey, I struggle with the same shit. You know what I mean? Like we, we've all got, we've all, we all get caught in that trap, but I can just say that I think we all know the answers. Be present to what the fuck we're doing. And, and, and mm, yeah. that is a discipline that we all have to work on in an age of technology where every, every piece of technology is trying to get your attention. And Instagram is doing a very good job of getting your attention because it's like a hundred different channels with all the cool shit you ever want to see. Oh, I love those cars. I love those asses. I love that movement. I love that. You know, and he's like, bow, 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 bow. Yeah. I, of course, it is genius, but it's only as powerful as what, again, what we allow it to be. So for us, we have to make a decision. Do we want to really be present again to what's in front of us? Like really be present because if you're really interested in a conversation, like right now, I don't want to, I'm not interested on getting on Instagram. Which one of you guys, no, which yeah. one of you guys in the last mi one hour and 45 seconds or uh, one hour and 45 minutes has thought about getting on Instagram one time? No, I haven't. No, no. no because we're no. all genuinely and sincerely paying attention we're present yeah. we're present to the conversation we're present to the thoughts that are being exchanged we're thinking we're listening we're exchanging that needs to happen everywhere else in our lives and what we're doing is we're placing greater value on one thing and lesser value on another so we're giving this a lot of value but we're giving that movie no value we're like ah i'm just kind of half-heartedly doing it well don't fucking half-heartedly do it Watch the movie like you're in a movie theater. You know, put it on and 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 give yourself give yourself the gift of being present to it. Like we used to have to do in a theater. You would never have picked up your phone and got on Instagram in a movie theater. No. <laughs> never. But, now they need to, to tell you not to do it at the start. Of course. Yes. But at yeah. home, at home. Of course, you have the you, you have the luxury of doing that because you're half invested in what you're doing. So we have to stop. Watch, like if you're going to watch a movie, watch it. If you're going to 
sit, if you're going to eat a meal, eat it. If you're going to sit with your kids, be with them. If you're going to, you know, whatever we're going to do, let's do it. If you're going to do jujitsu, do you know, how many times have you picked up your phone to check Instagram while you're, you're <laughs> while you don't because you're invested. Yeah, no, it's so true, mate. I think you said there were two things that came to mind. Consumption was one. What was the other? Sleep. Mm -hmm. Sleep. I mean, man, we got to sleep. Like, like, I don't think we place enough value. Like somebody's probably going to say, well, I think it's cold therapy. Fuck cold therapy. You need to sleep is what you need because you need to rest and you need to sleep deeply and soundly and joyfully. And, and, and if you don't sleep well, how can you recover from all of the, 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 you know, the demands of being, you know, being awake. So I think to me, uh, that is, 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 you know, uh, you know, wake and sleep is what you do your whole life. So to, 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 so the irony is that people would place such low value on sleep, considering it's something you do, the other half of your life <laughs> yeah. is, is insane. So you have to create conditions that you sleep well in because you, we all need, and, and, and I mean, I mean, there's so many studies on sleep and, and sleep deprivation and what it does to your, to your mind. I mean, you literally, I mean, you know, what's fascinating that the U S military government and military were able to pass um, sleep deprivation off as not being torture. Uh, for my, yeah, right. yeah, for the torture. They were yeah. able to define sleep deprivation as not torture. That's super clever. I can't remember what film I watched. They do that in a film with some terrorists. It's, it's, they, uh, are you, they, can, they blare music every every so many hours so that they can't sleep. Can you, and they they oh, puts them into psychosis, doesn't it? Of course, it, it will literally break you as a human being. Break you. So to say that it's not torture, oh my fuck, dude, this is fucking genius. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, it's yeah. fucking crazy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think we all need to sleep a bit more, mate. Uh, Cameron, that's that's been fascinating, mate. It's been a really interesting conversation. So, thank you. Uh, before we wrap up, tell us about uh, your academy and um, where people can find you if they want to reach out and, and work with you. Well, if anyone was, if anybody could get past all the bullshit that just came out of my mouth, you're so welcome <laughs> <laughs> to to find me uh, at. Uh, you know, it, first we live in Montana, the United States in the mountains. We run summer uh, education camps all summer long here. So anyone can join us in person for training. You can find that on budokan.com, you know, B-U-D-O-K-O-N. That's just our website uh, where you can find all of our events. You can all, if, if that's too far away, people can't make it. They can train with me online because Budokan online uh, exists for people who want to train remotely and they can work with me there. Uh, I have an entire, uh, you know, catalog and library of, of courses and, and, you know, of uh, videos that help people learn this work and Instagram, right. well, we on Instagram like every other human, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, under Cameron Shane, you can find me there. Yeah, well, we'll make sure we put all of your links in our description, mate, so people can find you if, if they want. But, um, but mate, thanks again. It's been a, a really interesting conversation. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Amazing, guys. Mate. Danny Thank and you. Paul, I really Enjoyed appreciate that. you too. It was a great conversation. Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. Thank you.